Praise the Lord. He has done mighty, marvelous, and wonderful things. And I can't even begin to exclaim that. I want to thank you so much for all your prayers at this time. Of, uh, someone said that your family's lost. We didn't lose anybody. He just left the planet. And we know where he is. My stepdad, who probably poured much more in my life than my real father ever did. And if that had a note of bitterness, there's none there, by the way. Uh, is that he was a great man. And I greatly miss him. And uh, you'll miss him. You just don't know it. He was such a source of counsel for, a, for me as a pastor. And I, I, it was a, a time of, of celebration as a funeral service. It's probably, I've been to a few funeral services that have almost compared with it. It was that just so anointed. God was so present from the time of praise and worship and to uh, testimonies. And uh, it was just a glorious experience in the Lord. I, the pastor of the church where the funeral was held he says, you know, I, I grew up in a church. I grew up in a pastor. So I've been a pastor, been through seminary, been through every conference you can imagine, every service you can imagine. He said, but I've never been in a worship service. He didn't call it a funeral like that in all my life. So we appreciate your prayers because the Lord did show up. Also about 150 relatives. <laughs> Only two of them asked me for money. So that was good. <laughs> so that was, that, that was a miracle, wasn't it? Praise the Lord. You know that is. But uh, it was amazing. You know, my stepfather had six children. My mama had six kids. And so that, that gave him 12 kids in total. And then you count their spouses, making 24. And then you add to that about 30-something grandchildren. I said this morning, the other count, 30-some odd. I thought, that wasn't right. <laughs> Some of them are odd, but... <laughs> add to that another 50 great-grandchildren and a couple of great greats, or one or two great greats. So it was quite a crowd we sh that showed up for the service. And it was three sections like this. The first five rows all the way across were reserved just for families. They packed in. And so uh, got a chance to say to the family all those things I've always wanted to say <laughs> together as a group. So God was good to me at the same time. And uh, it really was a revival service. I want to thank you again. I know many of you are praying and lifting us up. And uh, especially how you prayed for us over the last, you know, month and a half, I, I told Kathy, I said, you know, we, we left Belize April 21st, I believe, to come home for everything that was going on in the process, and then through her deal, and then back to this deal, I said, it has been nonstop. I said, I'm going to go to Belize on Thursday and see if I can stop it. <laughs> so, <laughs> whatever we left open, it's going to get closed, all right? So, but I do appreciate your prayers for us at this time. You have proven to be so faithful and such friends, and the sermon I preach to you is, is you're still my friends, I hope after I get done with it. Amen, because the sermon, as you can see by the screen title on, this, uh, on the screen, is for such a time as this. I preached this sermon t twice uh, in one format, in one fashion, at least this passage, this text message, on a, on a couple of occasions in our church. The last time was eight years ago, I look back on my, my schedule. Although we've used this a lot because you see on our signage, our letterheads and business cards, advertising, you always see this, this little banner under Believer's Fellowship for such a time as this. In fact, that was embraced... Uh, when I was in evangelism for 16 years, this was also our byline as a ministry. We were here. We believe God called us for such a time as this. Something got put in my spirit very early on in ministry. There was that, that phrase. It just seemed to, first time I read it in Esther as a young Christian, just captured my heart that, you know, that, that uh, we should realize that we are a unique people called for a very special time. And that God placed us each on the planet at this time for a very special purpose. And it's here for such a time as this. Now, this comes out of the passage. If, if you have your Bible, and open up to Esther 4. Uh, I don't have all the pa verses on the screen this morning due to time shortages to prepare PowerPoints. But we do have some of the verses. But in, in Esther chapter 4 is, is the whole story. Uh, it really starts with Esther chapter 1 through the end of the book. But 3 and 4 kind of capture the heart of what's going on. And just to give you a little setting of what the story's about for those who might not have read the book of Esther. And by the way, if you are going to heaven, I believe she will be there. So I would recommend you read it before you get there. What are you going to do when she comes up and says, hey, did you read my book? So, <laughs> anyway, in Esther, it's a story about uh, King Hazarias, and uh, this, this particular king, uh, he was a bit of a narcissist. The whole world was about him. Uh, he was, at the same time, pretty much a puppet kind of king. There were people who worked below him and cabinet levels and those kind of things, kind of like it is in the world today, who really pull the strings, who have the money, who make the calls and decisions. And there was a guy under him and his cabinet by the name of Haman. And Haman had a hatred for the Jews and wanted to extinguish them. Kind of similar to what we've seen throughout history, is it not? To kill the people of God, whether it's in the, in the book of Genesis, where, where you see Pharaoh trying to destroy them, or on through all the way to as recently as Hitler and the Arab 
climate of the, of, of the, of the world, you've seen that, that kind of hatred towards God's people. And they are a covenant people. And they represent the people of God. And they represent basically God's presence on the earth at this point in time. Now we know that God has basically engrafted us into the vine, praise the Lord. And we are God's people on the earth as well. But God had a plan for these people. They're living in a, in a place where there's a, a, a hatred towards them. And there's a guy by the name of Haman who wants to destroy them. And he's working behind the scenes with this cruel plot to destroy the Jews. Uh, meanwhile, this king, as he serves... His wife comes in one day and does something that displeases him. Ultimately, you can read the whole story. He has her put to death. Her name's Vashti. So Vashti is vanquished, and there's a beauty contest, put it in short. And there's a beautiful young woman by the name of Esther who's invited to be the, 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 the wife of the king. And she goes into the palace, and this woman's name is Esther, by whom the book is titled. Esther goes into the palace to be the queen for Ahasuerus. And so in the background scenario and story, we see that Haman is plotting to kill the Jews. Esther is now the queen. But she has also, Esther, another family member that enters the story by the name of Mordecai. And Mordecai has kind of been working behind the scenes as well. Not so much as Haman has for destruction, but for righteousness sake. And Mordecai is a, is a, is a man of faith, and he's also a righteous man. And he's the one who moves behind the scenes, getting Esther there and working to see that she is placed in the king's palace. And, uh, but the problem is still behind the scenes with Haman to destroy the Jews. Mordecai, Mordecai finds out about the plot. You can read in, in chapters 3 and 4 as he begins to discover the plot to destroy the Jews that Mordecai is, uh, is a man who moves to action. He's not content just to hear the bad news. He believes God has a purpose for his life. And in chapter 4, verse 1 of Esther, Mordecai learned all that had been done. He tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth and ashes. He went out in the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. He went as far as the king's gate because no one could come to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. In each and every province where the command and decree of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay on sackcloth and ashes. So here we have the story being discovered, that the plot being discovered to destroy the people of God. Now, I really think that somehow we have absolutely lost context of where we are in the culture that we're living in. Mordecai knows, many of the Jews are aware, and they began to mourn, and they began to well before the Lord, and they began to pray, and they praying fervently, and they began to take that drastic step called fasting. They begin to fast because they realize that destruction looms at the very door. Dear friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have got to wake up in our nation. Destruction is not only at the door, it's inside the door. We are in trouble as a people. And I believe much of the blame lies at the feet of the church because churches have become so desensitized and liberalized and socialized that we've forgotten the powerful message of the gospel. It's an amazing day that we're living in. How can we be so blind? How can we be so deaf? How can we be so ignorant to see all the destruction that's laying waste to our culture, to our nation, to the world as a whole, and do nothing and not be stirred to the point of mourning and wailing before God, lamenting in the streets about what is going on. Haman's threatening the Jews. Haman's really just an enemy driven by the devil as he seeks to destroy the Jews. And we have to understand that even like in those days, in these days, we are living in a time, we're living in an age, we're living in a, in a period of, of, of this world's time that God has given us, such as no other time. If it was bad then, I can guarantee you it is far worse now. And every aspect of your Christian life, every part of your Christian values, your principles, your conviction is being threatened at every level. And not only is it being threatened, and not only are we being maligned at every corner, we're just taking it. We're just, we're just sitting back and watching. We're just letting the world do its worst, and we don't rise to the occasion at any moment. I mean, you don't have to look far, look out the door. We can look at the problems that are plaguing our culture and society, our children, from, from the, the spiritual realm of witchcraft and Satanism to the physical realm of drugs and alcohol, abortion, crime on every hand. 
euthanasia, assisted suicides. There is no sanctity anymore for mankind. There is no morality for, for human life anymore. We will fight to save the lives of whales and, and dolphins and spotted owls and lizard lipped frogs or whatever they might be. But we don't care about human life. The fastest growing religion in the world is Islam, and next to that, if you want to call it a religion, is the New Age movement, humanism. It's a time of demonic activity. And it's just it's abounding everywhere we go. Wickedness is rampant. Sodomy is prolific everywhere you turn. I remember a time back in the 70s and 80s when the homosexual agenda was really taking off. I, I remember Jerry Falwell was a pastor back then from Liberty Church, you, you, you may know that name. He died about five, six, ten years ago, I guess. But I remember how many preachers of the day would laugh at him when he would get up and talk about the agenda of the, le the, the gay and the lesbian movement that was taking place in America. And now here it is. Your very liberties as an American citizen, forget the aspect of Christianity for a moment, just as American citizen are being threatened this very day. They're constantly being laws put before Congress that have already been passed in other parts of the world that they desire to see passed in this nation, which would make it illegal for me to preach a sermon like this that says homosexuality is a sin. In fact, they would, if it is passed, imprison me for such a message. So you better start setting not only a building fund side, you need to set another B for bail. Because if the Lord delays, this will happen in our culture. You'll have no civil liberties of your own anymore. It's always about tolerance unless you're talking about Christians. There is no toleration for the Lordship of Jesus Christ. There is no toleration for confessing that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. There is no tolerance for saying that the true standard of Scripture, the, the real the real standard of life is, is in the Bible, and it says certain things are right and certain things are wrong. That will be considered as radical hate speech. Have you ever been a subdued and seduced by the world around us and slumbered into a deep sleep like at no other time in history? Remember I asked if you'd still be my friend after this sermon. Because we need to be occasionally kicked in the spiritual shins and shaken by the nap of our spiritual neck to wake up and see where we are. There's a gay bar right across the street over here. And the agenda of those people, no matter how much you've been duped and lied to, believe that it's just a natural and normal behavior and a lifestyle, an alternative way to live, is perversion and it is sin. And I'll say that with as much love in my heart as I can. And I'll, you say, well, Brother Joe, uh, how can you say such thing? Because there's so many people who live that kind of lifestyle. So it can't completely be what you're saying. Yes, it can. And it is. And for them to embrace a mindset and to seduce you to believe the mindset that that kind of lifestyle is really just another minority group such as with a Hispanic group or an Asian group or a black group or whatever part of the world you might live in might be in a minority due to a racial background. They can't, there is no place for that kind of even synonymous activity or mindset for them to come along and say, oh, we're a minority group too. Any more so than for any husband in this room to say, it's all right for me to cheat on my wife because that's just the way I was born. And she's cute. And I think I like her and I have a desire, so I'll cheat. No, it's called adultery. But then, then why is homosexuality different? It's not. Any more than a person here, a single person, a young person or old single person who gets involved in an immoral lifestyle with another single person, it's called fornication. Now, I want you to know that we can't get you a minority group or minority status. Any more than the whole homosexual group should have a minority status or identification. But Brother Joe, I have this desire. I was born with this desire. You may have that desire. But you know, sometimes I have a desire that I need some more money, and what if I just rob that store? Well, 
Go ahead. You were born that way. Take what you want. Go get it. It's all yours, baby. Knock your lights out. And if they take you to court over it, say, that's the way I was born. And I've started a minority group, and we like legal status. Bank robbers of America. The BRA. I mean, you're laughing. It's stupid, isn't it? Yes, we, that's why Paul said, you know, you used to be fornicators. You used to be adulterers. You used to be effeminate. You used to be homosexuals, but now you've been redeemed. Yeah, yeah you could have been those things. <laughs> and why were you those things? Because you were a sinner. And sinners, by the way, that's their job description is to sin. They do that. All right. But when you get saved, you're not that anymore. And for you to go back and practice that behavior, if you genuinely are saved, it's sin. But show you how much we've been desensitized by our culture. It's not sin because I care about you, right? No, no, no. But that's what the culture says because we see it on every TV show. We see it in every movie. We see it in every drama. And we're continually bombarded with it. And we sit there and we watch it on our TVs. And we say, oh, isn't that sweet? He loves her. And they're hopping in and out of bed with each other. And we, we wonder why, you know, that immorality is rampant in our junior highs and our high schools. We say, what, what happened to my kids? I never told them that. Yeah, but you let them watch it eight hours a day. You took them to movies where it was rampant. You didn't say anything about it then. And now when they get involved, you go, well, why are you doing that for? Well, you didn't say anything was wrong when we, when we paid $15 to get in the movie. You didn't oppose it then when it was your favorite TV show. And now you wonder why your children are in such bondage. We live in a time like the time of Haman. It was a time of desperation. But we're not like the Jews at this point. We're not wailing. We don't care. We're not broken. Not only are we not doing anything about it, we're paying for it whether it's through the media industry that we embrace or our federal tax dollars that go to pay for the abortions. It's a time of desperation, folks. But not only a time of desperation, the same time as Haman's trying to tell Esther, I'm already guys trying to tell Esther, it's a time of destiny. This is a time, of, this is a time we need to do something. This is a time for being desperate. And Mordecai's desperate, you can see it. The Jews are desperate, you can see it. Esther's in the palace. Boy, does she ever represent us? She's living the palace life. That's the culture. I mean, that's what everybody goes for. We want to be the next American idol. We want prosperity. Not only is the material world a problem, it's creeped into the church. Everybody's preaching prosperity. God just wants you rich. God just wants you blessed. No bad times, no difficulty. No sadness, no sorrow. And if there is, then you must not be believing God. And so we see how that just has filtered on in to the church today. And now we're in this kind of delusion that we're living in. But I still believe that this is a time of destiny. Mordecai says, Esther, who knows whether you come to the kingdom just for this very issue. Maybe this is the very reason you are where you are. I believe in the sovereignty of God with all my heart. I believe I am where I am by the sovereignty of God, and I'm here for a reason. And I believe you are where you are for a reason. I believe you're in the family you're in. I believe you're in the school you're in. I believe you're in the church you're in. I believe you're in the neighborhood, the community, the subdivision, the state you're in by divine reason and divine purpose. Amen? That we are here for, and we're here for this time. Desperate times calls for desperate people. And we ought to rise to that occasion and say, I want to be one of those kind of people in my life. I want to be one of those kind of people who realizes, like the men of Issachar, the times that we're in, what the day is really like. And I want to realize that God has purpose and God has destiny and God has a plan for my life, that I really am the salt of the earth and I really am the light of the world and I really am an ambassador of reconciliation. That this world isn't my home, I need to quit acting like it is. And I am passing through. I am a pilgrim. I am a sojourner, as the King James says. And God has a plan for me, and I need to discover what it is. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who know that in their head, but in their hearts, they have refused to enter the battle. 
I know a lot of preachers like that who know this in their head, but in their heart, they're afraid to enter the battle. In the Texas vernacular, they are limp-wristed, panty-waisted, chicken-hearted, and the list could go on. But the issue is they refuse to rise up and to preach the truth from the pulpits of America as men of God. And woe be unto us if we do not preach the word of God. Fail because, well, what would people think? I mean, I, I wouldn't doubt that there's some visitors sitting here today saying, what's this thing over? <laughs> what is this deal going to be done? I'd like to bail right now, but what would people say? Because we just don't, we don't want to hear that. We're happy. We're comfortable. We're, that, we're like Azarias up there. Azarias is sitting there in his little comfortable throne room while everybody's pulling the strings. But he's happy. Leave me alone. We talk about a spiritual narcissism because we're more in ourselves. We enjoy the excesses. We enjoy the pleasures. We enjoy the palace life. And we miss the mark and we miss the will of God and we fail to realize that God has called us. Verse 14 says, if you, if you hold your peace at this time, if you hold your peace at this time, then God will send deliverance from somewhere else, the verse goes on to say. God will send deliverance from somewhere else. In other words, if you say, I'm happy where I am. I really don't want to get on fire for Christ, and I really don't want to be an ambassador, and I'm really not interested in being salt and light. Oh, I do, but I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to give up my sin. And I like it, you know, because we, like, we love sin. There's pleasure in sin, right? Uh, it's pleasure, but it's for a season. It's not going to last long. It's going it's to it's cut you before it's all over, and it's going to hurt you before it's all over. And nothing hurts you. It's going to hurt your kids. It's going to hurt your family. It hurts your church, according to what the Scripture teaches. But here's the deal. God said, okay, you don't. Fine. I'll put you over here. I'm done. This is what Paul said. My greatest fear is that I should become a castaway. Not that he would lose his salvation, but that he would lose his usability, his functionality, his purpose, his destiny would be lost. And he'd just become casual and carnal, backslidden, defeated. Yes, going through the motions, but no power. Just going through what, what looks good. And you miss the time of destiny. The third point from this is, it was a time of demonic warfare. Verse 15, Esther bade them to return. Mordecai, you go back and, and gather all the Jews that are present in Shushan. You gather them and then you fast for me. And don't eat, drink for three days, night or day. And I will do the same thing. She's not asking him to do something she's not willing to do, all right? I'll do the same thing and my maidens will fast likewise. And I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. I have no legal right to go in there. Vashti went in, she lost her life. But if I die, I die. See, she realized when calling for fasting and calling for prayer that there's a war, a spiritual war going on. And she realized there's more at stake than, than, than Haman and Hasarias the king and her own life, that there's a spiritual battle. And I want you to know, as we look around and we can identify problems in our culture from abortion to homosexuality, you know, to the, to the, the acceptance of gay marriage and all those things. We see all those political agendas and all those things going on under the guise of civil liberties, all right? It's really just sin. And we see those things. We say they're wrong, but yet we're not willing to pray about it. And we don't fast about it. This is not where she's at. She realizes that those things are out there, but there's something undercurrent, and the undercurrent thing is a spiritual problem. Because I can pray about physical things, but I need to realize that the physical things that are happening, there's something compelling and propelling and motivating them behind the scenes that I cannot see with human eyes. That Satan is alive and well, as Hal Lindsey said years ago on planet Earth. And that he is moving and he's working. He has an agenda. He has a plan. He, he, he comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And it's not just talking about in general. It's talking about you. It's talking about me. It's talking about the church. He wants to rob us blind. He wants to take what belongs to us in Christ. He can't praise the Lord, but he can certainly make us ineffective and impotent. If we fail to pray, if we fail to seek God's face, and if we fail to at the times we need to fast, then we're certainly going to be defeated. Even Jesus said there are times certain demonic forces will only come out by fasting and prayer. I tell you, you go through Scripture and you see the people fasting at different times, realizing that there's, there's something else that's needed than just a casual little time of prayer or Bible study. 
First of all, biggest thing about fasting, is it really is for me and my relationship with the Lord. It brings me closer to the Lord. It gets me to a place occasionally when I I'll choose to fast that I realize that God is more important than my food. Job said that God's word is more important to me than my necessary bread. It's necessary that I eat, I die. But there are times when I can show God that he's more necessary than my food by fasting. And in that time of discipline and surrender and sacrifice, God does some special things, unique things in my life. One thing he does, it helps me in finding and discovering his will. Some of you might be looking for God's will in some situation. Maybe it's time to hear the call to fast, to stop eating for a day, to lay aside three meals in a row perhaps, and just to say, I want to take those times that I eat those meals and spend it in time with God in his word and ask him to speak to me. I've had people come to me and with bondage in their life and they say, I don't know how to get over it or I've overcome this. I have a habit I can't seem to break. What should I do? I always tell them two things. One, I want you to start memorizing Romans chapter 6. And the second thing I want you to do is I want you to start fasting. I want you to do at least one day a week of fasting. Well, you'll take those three meals and you'll give those to the Lord. And you'll say, I'm going to do, instead, I'm going to eat the bread of your word. I'm going to seek your face. Isaiah 58, 6, is not this the fast I've chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Well, there's a great passage on fasting, what it does. It breaks the yoke. Fasting, but we've forgotten it. And then you see how God used it and calls the nation of Israel to fast for protection of the nation, whether it's in 2 Chronicles 20 or Jonah chapter 3, when he calls, to, calls them to a fast. Sometimes it's just a, a, you're in a spiritual place in your life and it doesn't seem that anything's happening or you're not getting anywhere and you're not going anywhere and just there comes that time you just need to stop and spend some time with God and go be called in your own heart to a fast so that God can speak to you in very clear words. Second Chronicles 7, 14, it, it, it's used in, in the national awakening and promise God gives for a national awakening. He says, you know, if my people will fast, pray and seek my face. Why is that we need to do it? Because we are really not fighting flesh and blood. Prayer and fasting put us in that spiritual arena and that is the place we have absolute victory because we have absolute authority in Jesus Christ. These are difficult times which require us to realize that we're a destiny people but we're also fighting a spiritual battle and you can't sit back on your spiritual laurels and say, I'm going to let somebody else do it because if you choose to live that way, you will be carried into captivity if you're not there already. And you'll find yourself doing things. You say, I never would have thought I'd do those things. What have I come to? Because you allowed yourself to be brought into bondage. But it's also a time of dispensation whether you're a dispensationalist or not, you must agree that we are living in a time the Bible calls the church age, which is the last age, which is the end times age, where Jesus Christ would come and bring himself up a bride and a people who would stand on the planet in the last days to declare the gospel to all men. And it's our responsibility that in this particular age and period, we realize once again the power of the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that becomes our focus in our vocal walk, in our life, our lips, our words all match up to declare that Jesus Christ is ridden from the dead as Lord of lords. He has paid the price to wash away every sin, and people can be redeemed, and people don't have to live in captivity, and people don't have to live in bondage, but they can be free in Christ. It's a dispensation period. I love the scriptures. It talks about the last days and all the prophecies of the days and the signs of the times in Matthew 24. Whether you go back to the Old Testament and look in the prophecies of Ezekiel and you see all the prophecies about the end times in the Middle East and the Russian forces. Are, it doesn't say Russia. It just says the great bear to the north. Man, and they're already clab, clang, clanging their swords again as Putin goes back into office. And he's nothing but a communist murdering, God-hating communist. Well, Brother Joe, I think I've seen him pray. We can say that about a lot of officials, can't we? But we don't listen as the people of God to what people say with their lips. We look at the fruit of their lives. What do they stand for? Do they have character? Are they people of integrity? But yet we just said, and we're seeing, I mean, open your eyes. We are seeing one thing after another. The scripture said what happened just prior to the revelation of Jesus. The, the apocalypse, which is the unfolding, the opening. Everybody thinks apocalypse is something terrible. Apocalypse is glorious. Jesus reveals himself. That's what it means. Manifest himself to the world as the king of kings and lord of lords. 
Yeah, there's going to be hell in the last days, but we're entering in that doorway now. What's going on in the Middle East is no accident with Egypt and Syria and all the Islamic threats that are taking place around us. And yet we're sitting by churches. People called Christians are embracing Islam like they're their brothers. They're not my brother. Only those who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their, for their eternal salvation belong to the family of God. One Lord, one faith, one spirit, one baptism. And that's not hate speech. I say it with forcefulness because we are so stupid. We believe whatever the TV tells us to believe. We embrace like ignorant sheep whatever food is laid in the trough. I know I want you to know that the false prophets of our day can certainly make it look palatable and spiritual and Christian, but it's not. And we need to heed the warning of Paul in Romans chapter 13 where he said, and this do, knowing the time, underline that, knowing the time, we must know the time, this is the day. It's already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, get up, get out of bed. Salvation is near to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone, the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness, put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the days, not in carousing, that's party life, drunkenness, Sexual promiscuity, sensuality. We say, I don't do that. Strife. Quit fighting with each other. Quit being bitter. Jealousy. Do what? What should I do? Put on Jesus. Make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. What is he saying? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Get your heart right with God. Decide to be, no matter what the conditions dictate around you, decide in spite of everything else, in spite of every fad, in spite of every new political move, in spite of every new agenda that the world puts on the table for us, we're still going to shine. We're going to stand for truth. We're not going to be mean-spirited. We're not going to be hateful. We're not going to be ugly. We're just going to say, well, I know what you say, but the Bible says. Now, I heard a guy the other day say, well, people don't believe what the Bible says. Well, that's, that's their problem. Uh -huh. Duh. <laughs> but we still, we still proclaim it, thus saith the Lord. We don't have to find a particular way to debate the truth. God's already given us a debate. I love the story, you ever heard the story of a guy named Bert Olney who gave his life to the Lord? He was one of those guys in church who was always arrogant, you know, always critical, always putting people down. In fact, the young pastor was called to the new church and Bert Olney went to debate him, put him in his place. I don't like what you do. You know, the young preacher had one thing, said, you know, the Bible says, Bert, <clears throat> It's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Well, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about your sermon and what you, no, no. Bert, the Bible says it's appointed unto die, once to die and then the judgment. But I'd like to have a, a civil debate with you and, and not around the Bible, you, you just a debate on an intellectual basis. <clears throat> well, Bert, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Bert only was mad. He didn't like hearing that. He just kind of threw his hands up, walked away, and it was a time we didn't have cars, early America, and he's walking home through the woods to his home. And there were tree frogs all along the way that normally would say, Ruby. But all he heard as he went home, frog after frog said, judgment, judgment, judgment. Some of them sing a little higher, judgment, judgment. Next morning, he went to find that young pastor. He said, I'd like to discuss that verse that you talked about last night. And he gave his life to Christ. We need to get back to saying the Bible, the Word of God. Well, I don't believe it, but still the Word of God. Well, let's part of the debate on an intellectual basis. I would if you could, but you can't because you don't believe the Bible. You've, you've proven how in, unintellectual you are. Well, I don't believe the Bible. Have you ever read it? Well, no. <laughs> How stupid can you be? <laughs> Don't try to tell me you're like when you haven't even read it. How can I have a civil debate with you? We're so afraid. Got our heads stuck in the sand like a bunch of Baptist ostriches. Not just Baptist, all across the denominational board and undenominational board and non-denominational and transdenominational and all the other words we use. We're hurting people. And the devil is having a heyday. And we are here for such a time as this. 
God put you on the planet in this age, right here, right during this time. This is the best time to be alive. These are the best days. Now, some of you of where, where I've walked here the last month, you have been crazy six or eight weeks in my house. I don't know about your house. They've been nuts at my house, all right? And somebody else said this morning, they came, I guess you're really tired. I said, you know, I'm a little tired. I said, but I'm having time in my life. I've seen God do so many things. It's blowing me away. In fact, I couldn't tell you all of them because, one, you might not believe me. And some of you have trouble doing that already. And two is, you know, I feel a little selfish. God's blessing me so much. I really, I, I, I've, you know, it's like the old hymns. I, my eyes have seen the glory. <laughs> and some of you are seeing the glory. But we want to see the glory in our country. We want to see the glory in our families. We want to see the glory in our church. And listen, if we keep doing what we're doing, we're not going to see it. You keep living the way you're living, you're not going to see it. You keep just standing, you know, in that same, you call it a routine. Let's give you the abbreviated term, same rut, which is really just the grave with the ends kicked out. You're not going to see it. But we are here for such a time as this. this is a, these are the best days to be alive. There are believers from days gone by who would think, boy, wouldn't it be neat to live in those last days right before Christ's coming when hell, all hell's breaking loose on the planet, Satan's making his biggest moves. He's getting ready to put his man in power. What would it be like to be there in that time? Well, we'll be able to tell them if we'll be faithful. It is a time of dispensation, but last, not least, it's a time of decision. Esther had to make a choice. And so do you, and so do I. Am I going to be just another preacher? Just another husband? Just another dad? Just another spouse? Just another citizen? Just another church member? Or am I willing, are you willing, like Esther, to say, I have got nothing to lose and everything to gain. I've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. But God forbid that I stand at the judgment seat of Christ and have been unfaithful to God's word. Stand there embarrassed in the throne room of heaven. Tears streaming down my cheek as the Holy Ghost and God the Father and God the Son revealed to me every opportunity I had and blew it. I don't want to be like that. And I don't believe any of us in this room want to be like that, do we? And what we have to do, and I certainly, it's an old Latin terminology that's certainly been abused in the terminology of it, but it's carpe diem, seize the day. This is our day, church. This is the day. You look around, people are desperate. Don't you let some deadhead Christian tell you people don't want to hear the gospel anymore. People are dying. They hadn't heard it for decades. Churches hadn't preached the gospel for decades. There are people you'll walk across the street that you can meet that have never heard the gospel. There are children all across this nation. They go out at Christmas time and they see a nativity scene. They have no idea what that means. We've, we've been given some tremendous responsibilities, but those responsibilities are glorious opportunities. Rich with God's grace, full of God's provision, with, with, a, with kind of a, a it's, it's like the tide that comes in and out. It brings in God's grace and carries out his glory. And as we're sitting there destitute, perhaps in our situation, needing something from God, the tide will flow. God said, I'm like the former rain, the latter rain. I will do something if you let me. I am predictable about some things. I want to send revival and I want to send power and I want to send grace and I want to send strength and I want to send mercy to every child of mine. That's in the will of God for all of us. But we cannot be isolationist. That's everybody else's problem. I'm happy. Spiritual narcissism, as we say. To whom much is given, folks, much is required. And we've been given much. Haven't we? Yes. We've been given so much. 
But we've got to turn our eyes away from our little pity parties. And what can I get out of it? And what, can, what you going to give me? And how can you help me? I, I really believe some of you go home, go to bed at night, and you think the world stops. You know? And it's kind of like a TV program. When you get up in the morning, God hits play. And everything starts up again for you. Amen? You know, because your world's all that matters. What have I got? What can you give me? I can help me. They didn't do this. They don't drive fast enough for me. You know, they don't, they don't pay it. They don't give me enough money where I go. And they don't realize how valuable I am here. And boy, it's all, what can I get? What can I get? What can I get? What can I get? Got to get. I got to get. I'm tired. You know, you don't respect me. You got to, you got to help. You got to pat me on the back. You got, you got to show some love, brother. Jesus said, I did not come to serve. I came to serve. I did not come to get, but I came to give my life a ransom for many. That's where grace is. That's where joy is. That's where peace is. That's where power is. That's where revival is. We quit worried about what it's going to cost us. And so many people are content to just have church on Sunday morning. God forbid I'd go on a Bible study or a lift group. That's sacrifice. Or I'd give money. 10%? You've got to be out of your mind. You know how much that is? I'll go when it's convenient. I'll go when it's pleasant for me. I'll go when it's acceptable for me. I'll go when it's nice in my time on my schedule. Don't bug me. I'll go somewhere else. Getting too quiet in here. <laughs> Light sometime. I think y'all go to sleep or leave. I'm not sure. <laughs> Some of you already left mentally, all right? Isn't that where we are? Amen. Jesus said you're like children playing in the market. We use the old terminology, take my ball and go home. That's the way we put that passage. If you don't play ball my way, I'm out of here. How many people are sitting in church today looking for a church home? And what are they doing? They're shopping. We don't need to be shopping for churches. We pray about where do you want me, God. Where, where can you put my life that I can use? The gifts you've given me to make a powerful difference in that fellowship and in that community for the glory of God. Where's my spot? Put me in, coach. <laughs> Anybody on a bit on second string of that attitude? Put me in, coach. Yeah. Let me play. I want to play. I, that's the reason, I think, first in junior high when I started playing football, that's probably the only reason. But they got tired of listening to me. I want to play. I want to play, coach. My turn. <laughs> that ought to be that way in our spiritual life. My turn. Let me in. My turn. I don't want to be a spectator. I don't want to be a fan. I don't want to be sitting on the sidelines. I don't care if the pews are cushioned. I want to end the game. You know... Paul said, get out of bed. Put on your armor. There's a fight to be had. We have trouble getting out of bed just to go to church, much less to the fight. Now, your pastor loves you. I know you don't think he does. But he loves you. All right? And I'm going to continue to lead the charge toward hell. I'm not going to spend my time looking over my shoulder. <laughs> I just want to see you moving along. And if you're in charge of ministry, you keep on. I don't have to be where you're at all the time. All right? Some of you have started to learn that. You just started having church by yourself where you're doing it. Amen? You started realizing, hey, I can do this. I can praise the Lord and have this Bible study. I can have this breakfast. I can have this ministry time. I can lead the charge. I can, I, you know, yeah. it's amazing how many people look around and say, you didn't come to that Bible study, Pastor. But there's only so many of me. Why don't you come to all mine and I'll come to yours? <laughs> Amen? I'd better shut up. I asked the Lord Timberland to shut up. This is not, please understand, this is not a rant. We're in trouble. And if the homosexual gay agenda has their way, they'll be indoctrinating your kids, and in many schools they already are. Years ago when we laughed about it never coming to spring, here we are. It's in the school system, we have gay days, the whole thing. All right? Because the church went to sleep. And it's just it's going to get worse. If we totally, fully embrace as a culture the homosexual sodomite agenda, then you just open the door for every kind of perversion from bestiality to pet pedophiles to everything else. 
Oh, it may take 10 years, it may take 20 years. I mean, in other cultures, they're already putting old people to sleep, killing them, because they're just too much trouble. Euthanasia is accepted in many cultures now. Boy, wait till you get a hold of your new health care plan. <laughs> health care will be considered putting you down at one point in time. That's the best thing for you. It's the best thing for your country. It's the best thing for your culture. If you really were a good American citizen, at 72, we'll quit taking care of you so you can go ahead and die. <laughs> if I don't say amen, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> we're in trouble. It's a time, time, a disastrous day we're living in. But it's also a time of destiny. It is a time of demonic warfare. We're going to fast and pray. Amen. Some of you can start praying and fasting this week for our Belize country and conferences that are be going on. You can sign up out there this week and say, yeah, I'll fast a day during that time or two days during that time. Three meals in a row somewhere. Whether it's lunch, dinner, and breakfast or breakfast, lunch, and dinner or dinner, breakfast, and lunch, I'll fast for three meals. I can do that. I am not such a glutton that I can't stop eating for a few meals. I don't think. We'll find out. I can do that for the glory of God. I can, I, can, I can become concerned about my neighbors again. I can become concerned about the people at the grocery store again. I can, can become concerned about the person at the fast food place again. I can start being a prayer warrior again for, my, for the people that I work with. I can become concerned again. I can be law, a light and I can talk, but I can only do it by the power of God, so I need to pray and you see God's face. Today, there's some of you here, you've never even given your life to Christ. That's first base on anything in the Bible, all right? You've got to come to know Jesus. And it's not about praying a prayer, walking an aisle, getting sprinkled, or baptized, or going through some type of confirmation. It's about you surrendering your heart. Jesus put the plan of salvation like this. If anybody wants to come after me, let him come. Deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. In other words, you say no to yourself. Accept what Jesus did on the cross for you. Embrace the cross of Jesus till he paid the price for all your sins and follow him. That's Christianity. We have too many people who believe they're saved, but they never follow Jesus. You're not a Christian if you're not following. If you've never followed, now it's possible to follow and sit down for a while, but I want you never comfortable, and the Holy Ghost will chasten you till you get up. Or he'll just take you out. Or let you go your ways, which is even worse. So if you don't know Christ, you've never given your life to him, we're going to give an invitation just a minute if our music team will come. We're going to give an invitation. Come, please, pay attention. <laughs> and we give this invitation. I'm going to ask you to first and foremost open your heart to whatever God is saying to you. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, that today would be the day that you would do that. It's a simple it's, a, it's, it's as simple as taking a gift and opening it up. It's the gift of life. It's the gift of mercy. It's the gift of love. It's the gift of grace. It's the very gift of the first of your real living days. Give your heart and your life to Christ. And if you do that today, start right there where you are. You say, Lord, I, I surrender. Just tell him, I surrender. I, give I turn my back on myself. Cleanse me of my sin. I give you it all. And then come and let one of us that will be standing here in the front, for our pastoral team and the elders and Lift leaders, whoever's coming this morning to serve an invitation, you come now. Come, 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 come. Pay attention. <laughs> you come to one of us that are here this morning and let us pray with you. Let us agree with you. Thank God for moving your heart and touching your life. I can have somebody over here, please. Any one of these men this morning any one of them, you can come to and say, I want to give my life to Christ. I'm giving my life to Jesus today. They'll rejoice with you. They'll pray with you. They'll share a word with you from the scripture. They'll steps of action you need to take in your life to honor the Lord, to really follow Christ. If you're a Christian today and you know that you have been stagnant and stale and you have come to the position of Esther chapter 4, there's no other place. There's no other way. If it's death, it's death. If it's life, it's life. It doesn't matter. I just want what God wants. If you're in that place today, you know you hadn't been where God wanted you to be in your life. Why don't you just embrace that? Deny yourself. Part. Say, I want to get right with God. And you come. You can come pray with anyone else if you want. Or you can just come find a place here between you and the high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess your sin to him, the Bible says. He'll forgive you. He'll wash away. He'll cleanse every sin. And you can be freed and full and clean and pure 
in the very eyes of God. Now, there may be lingering thoughts and condemnation, but that's all out of hell. That's not from God, amen. But God gives us freedom. And you'll have to do battle to get to that place of victory sometimes because it is a spiritual war. But it starts with getting our hearts right, humbling ourselves, yielding ourselves to Jesus. And I'm gonna encourage you in a moment to do that. Come find a place to pray. Some of you are sitting there and you've been a church member a long time, but you've not yet done anything in your life as far as ministry. You don't have to have an official title, but you need to be actively serving the Lord. Some capacity, some way, some form, some fashion. And you say, well, I don't know what it is. You do too, you're just not listening. <laughs> or you're denying it. Well, that's not what God wants. Because God speaks to us if we'll just listen. And it usually starts by doing the simplest things. Speaking to the person God tells us to, praying for the ones God leads us to, encouraging those who God tells us to encourage, stepping out past our timidity into boldness, being what God wants us to be in those situations. You'll be surprised the doors will open when you start doing that, caring about people and loving people. Maybe you're here and you're looking for a church home and the guy kind of had second thoughts this morning. I believe if this is where God wants you, the boy had already sprung up in your heart. You know, I need to be in a church like that. I need to be under preaching like that. I need to be in a, in a, in a scenario of people that love Jesus like that. Why don't you come and let one of us know, this is where I believe God wants me to serve him and be involved for the glory of God. Let's stand together. With our heads bowed, our hearts.